is going to be a discussion about how can you use big data for uh, advancing gender equality and understanding gender differences in health outcomes. This work is still very in the very beginnings at UN. Um, UN Global Pulse, that is an initiative that leverages big data across all SDGs, uh, has been leading this work. Uh, so I'm going to present some examples of how to use big data for development, and I'm going to discuss uh, what are the main inequality traps, not only in terms of gender, uh, but also in terms of north-south and, uh, for example, um, in terms of differences in the frameworks for data privacy across countries. So feel free to, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's not going to be very technical, but because we have um, experts in the room, I, I assume that will be more technical uh, questions. Uh, so I hope that we all um, can be uh, involved in the discussion and particularly try to link it with uh, some of the main insights that we have from yesterday in terms of, for example, differences in access and use of um, ICTs and with the impact on, on health outcomes. Okay, so the first question when we try to measure, to monitor uh, progress towards the SDGs, if you think about SDG 5, that is ach achieving gender equality, is mini gender. So when we try to answer the question how equal men and women are in all, situ in all um, areas of life, gender data is needed. So this, there's a big gap in terms of availability of gender data. So gender data is important for SDG, but is also important across, for SDG 5, but also important across all the other SDGs. So in terms of the SDG framework, uh, there's around 54 S uh, gender related SDGs, and we have data only for 12 of the indicators. So it's less than one third. So this implies that we don't know what is the state of the world in terms of gender equality in uh, most areas of, um, of life. Uh, even in terms of health, that is the area where more, more data exists and more gender disaggregated exists, we have gender disaggregated for less than half of the gender related indicators on health. And um, if you think about unpaid um, care work or about gender-based violence, the situation is a bit more dramatic in, in terms that we don't have data and we don't have uh, uh, up-to-date data. For example, gender-based violence, the last statistics that we have uh, are coming from the WHO report that was um, the, the global uh, estimates of GBV that was um, published in 2013. So it means that all the data that is still used to uh, reflect the gender-based violence is from data of at least seven, or in most of the cases, 10, 10 years ago. To 10, sorry, years ago. So that makes some, I think there are some implications of that because we know that gender-based violence is still prevalent, but this is just a guess. In a way, we are trying to, to, to implement programs and to solve problems that are one decade old. So we need up-to-date gender data. So one of the initiatives to have uh, gender data that will be available for governments, for policy, uh, and also to, and to monitor SDGs was uh, the gender index, the SDG gender index that uh, was developed by Equal Measure. So it's a very recent index from 2018, and it has um, been presented as, as the state of the heart to measure and monitor um, gender inequalities. Um, compared to the previous framework, the Millennium Development Go Goals, uh, in the SDG we have a big progress in terms of gender data, because gender data is recognized to be relevant across all SDGs, whether in the Millennium Development Goals, gender data was more uh, synonymous, equated by uh, uh, gender parity in education. So because it's easy to, to measure uh, gender differences in education, gender parity was mainly focused on education. So we have a big challenge now. We understand the importance of measuring gender differences across 
there are all these uh, different areas of life, but we still don't have this gender. So this is the main message, I think, from my um, presentation today. So even for SDG 5, uh, yesterday we talked about the different tiers. So we have tier 1 and tier 2 indicators. So tier 1 are indicators for which um, data exists and is regularly collected by uh, at least half of the countries. And, uh, and there's also standards for what constitutes quality data. So for SDG 5, we have only four indicators that are tier one indicators. All the others are tier two indicators. In terms of um, uh, gender disaggregated indicators for health, this, these are a table from the uh, World Health Statistics Report by WHL that was released this year that for the first time present gender disaggregated data for health indicators. And even for health, we have indicators for less of the relevant indicators. So not all health indicators are relevant for gender because we have some indicators, for example, that are collected at household of higher level. We have indicators that are female specific, but for those that can be disaggregated, we have data only for around 14 of these indicators. And why is important uh, to have this gender? We know that it's important to, evolve, to, to, um, to have evidence-based policies, to make policy decisions. We are important to understand what works. Uh, it's important to understand, um, to, to do evaluation, to do planning, to design interventions. Uh, but also, if you don't know the if you don't know the, the extent of the gender inequalities, you cannot derive conclusions for other SDGs. We know that gender cuts across um, all these different SDGs, and we know that, for example, there's a direct relationship between um, child marriage and um, enrollment in education. So if you don't have data for child marriage, we cannot also uh, have models that allow us to validate data that we have um, for um, gender inequalities in education. And we can also think about uh, you know, social, how social norms influence women's participation in household decision making and the health outcomes for children. So this type of associations that we know that exist that highlight the importance of gender inequalities to achieve other outcomes, they are only possible with gender, with gender data. Okay, so if you don't have gender data, what are the other types of data that are available that we can leverage to understand gender inequalities? And yesterday we talked about uh, citizen-generated data. I'm going to talk about it later as well, but I would like to talk about big data today. So in which ways big data will help us to fill this gap? The uh, one thing that is clear is big data cannot replace uh, gender statistics. Um, there, there has been some resistance from national statistical offices to take on board all these different uh, innovations related to data, whether it's small data, big data, thick data, because this data is very imperfect from a methodological point of view. So we know how the bad data can do more harm than good. So there's a big resistance. So all these projects that are related with big data, they have been developed in parallel to all the SDG data collection that is carried out by the uh, custodian agencies, mainly the NSOs in, in these countries. And just to give you a picture, um, in terms of the uh, financing for gender statistics, there's only 30% 30, 30 of the countries in the world, NSOs, that have a budget dedicated for gender statistics. So even if there is this resistance to take new initiatives and new types of data, it, it doesn't mean that the gender statistics, there will be any future, I mean, for gender statistics, because this, this, this problem is not going to be solved in the next years. So we need to find alternative solutions to fill these uh, gender data gaps. So just for those of you never heard of big data or have misconceptions about that, big data has been traditionally presented as new forms of data that cannot be analyzed and stored 
in the ways that we traditionally store small data. So big data has been defined in terms of what is not. So big data is everything that is not traditional data. It's all the data sources that for which we cannot employ, um, for example, we cannot store in an Excel file, so we need different softwares, we need different analytic techniques, we need different data privacy frameworks. But in terms of the physical characteristics, attributes of this data, this data has been defined in terms of the three Vs, that was volume, variety, and velocity. So it's big data in terms of the volume of data, in terms of the types of data that it contains. It can be multi-format, can be image, can be audio, it can be written, uh, can be numbers. Um, and also the velocity. The velocity means that we can have data, or data created organically, real-time data or near real-time, because big data always implies some time to process it. We, it's never available in real-time, but it's data that is more timely than the data that we have, for example, from surveys. And there are then different approaches to big data, for example, in social sciences, we talk about the vinculation that has to do with the data linkages or integration with, for example, surveys. So the way that we can um, attribute some meaning to indicators from big data is to validate it with indicators that went through a uh, thoughtful process of uh, testing that, um, that abide for the standards of the, of the social sciences, for example. Uh, but data vinculation is something that you know everyone talks about interoperability, about data linkages. So it's one of the things as well. And veracity that has to do with epistemological questions related to what kind of knowledge this this data entails and uh, what are the quality of these measurements. So for in the development world, these V's that are more the physical attributes of the data has been replaced by the three C's. So the three th C's are the communities, the digital crimes, and the capacity. So the digital crimes um, means that uh, all the, the, the big data just reflects the transactions that people have online, and they leave these digital crimes that they reflect some aspects of their lives. The communities uh, means that we need to understand what are the communities that are involved in generating this data, in governing this data, and in using the data. So policy makers, um, the communities that create the data, the context where this data is created by these communities, we need to understand that if you want to leverage big data for development. And finally, we have the capacities. So the capacities are related with the skills that are needed to derive value from this data for policy. And we know that these capacities is a big weakness at this moment because these, <coughs> these skills are not equally distributed across the world and not are equally distributed, for example, if you think about the private sector from compared to, for example, development organizations, or, you know, NGOs, is not there yet. So the, when you think about this unequal distribution, distribution of the skills, we need to think what will be the implications that this can create new, more inequalities because if some groups they can derive more value from this data than others, they will be in a better position to make more informed decisions and um, to advance the well-being of the people that they are serving. In terms of the different types of big data, <coughs> the, there are different data sources, but we can maybe uh, classify it in terms of the four main. We have the human source data that um, includes all the social media data, uh, all the uh, searches, uh, the queries online, um, on uh, wikis, uh, blogs, and so on. It's all the data that's generated by individuals in terms of the content. And we have the process of mediated data, that is transactional data. It's data that is generated, but is a byproduct of any activity online. For example, we can think of um, e-government, we can think of financial transactions. I think that medical records can also be considered process mediated data. There's some differences with what is administrative data and what is big data, and there's no it's, there's no clarity about what can be considered, and usually the criteria is in terms of volume. So medical records 
it can be administrative data, but you can think about the data that are produced uh, from um, digital health technologies that would be considered big data. Uh, and then you have the machine generated data, that is data that doesn't relate to individuals, it's like Internet of Things, satellite imagery, and finally we have the media sourced, sourced data, that is data that has the intent to communicate. So we can think of pod podcasts, we have of uh, uh, digital news, we have uh, radio broadcasts and so on. So we can think of how these different categories of big data can help us to monitor SDGs. And I would say that there are examples of relevance across all these different categories. So I'm going to give you some examples of them. So for example, social media data. Um, this is a study that was done with UN women to understand um, the value of using Twitter data uh, to monitor trends in violence against women in Brazil. So there are many problems with using Twitter data. We know that we are st starting with a very skewed group. We know that Twitter is mainly used by millennials and they are young, educated and predominantly female. But Brazil is a case of where the Twitter uptake is very high, so it's, I think, among the thir three countries in the world with the highest uptake of Twitter. And although we don't have gender disaggregated data for Twitter use, uh, because it's so prevalent, we may think that these gender differences are not as crucial and in other countries where the Twitter uptake is low. So this is just an assumption, but we need to, to, to take into consideration that we may, may have started with some difference, gender differences, when we decide to use this data. So we have underlying theory here that is we cannot measure violence against women based on Twitter. There's no parallel in terms of what we expect to see in the ground in terms, for example, of killing of women. But if you look at Twitter, the way that people talk about violence, it will give us a proxy or indication of the social norms, what is accepted when we talk about violence against women. And maybe this acceptance as a pro proxy for social norms will give us an I some idea of the fluctuations in terms of public opinion. And we can see, for example, what will be the impact of some cases of violence that are um, uh, vehiculated by the media and what is the impact of this in public opinion. Or, for example, something that we did, we can see what are the impact of the elections in Brazil in you know, Bolsonaro, and before Bolsonaro we have, um, um, maybe we cannot talk about the elections here, I'm sorry. Uh, but we can do that, we can understand what is the impact of a female president in Brazil in the public opinion related to women and violence against women. So uh, the type of analysis that we can do with, um, uh, with Twitter data is to understand trends over time and also do topic modeling that is um, answering the question like what people talk about when they talk, when they talk about violence. So um, the, the, the biggest part of the world, I would say like the, the major efforts of uh, getting this data to understand these nuances on violence against women is uh, creating um, a corpus of words that are related with violence. So this needs to be interdisciplinary work. We need to have country experts. We need to have people who generate it, like people who are in Twitter in Brazil, uh, who can help us to identify what are the expressions and words that are used related to violence against women. And when we have this corpus with these different words and expressions, we can filter Twitter data, and then we can start seeing some patterns. The data is not self-explanatory. So if you look at this data, and I choose this graph because it's very obvious that we have a peak here in a certain day. So this is International Women's Day. So, but we need to have this knowledge to interpret this data. And here it's obvious, but in most situations, interpreting big data um, outputs uh, and transformative insights that can be valuable for organizations or governments or, or, or other groups is, uh, I think, a uh, big challenge that we have at the moment. Another example is um, how we can use big data to monitoring disease outbreak in, in Uganda. So this is part of the health surveillance system in Uganda where the um, administrative records from health facilities 
are collected and they are um, um, so, and it will overlay with other factors to understand transmission of diseases. So this particular example was the Typhoid National Task Force, where they wanted to understand what whether um, movements of people or rainfall would impact the cases of typhoid across Uganda. Other example is in Malawi with satellite imagery. Um, so the, uh, with, uh, with one of the challenges also in terms of data in African countries is census data that is not collected regularly and in some countries it doesn't exist at all. So for example in Somalia there's no census. So in terms of understanding where the populations uh, are concentrated, if you need to understand uh, movement of people also, we, we need to understand, we need to use to leverage other types of data such as satellite imagery. And this type of data is being used uh, now to complement census. For example, I think in Afghanistan, the last census they used this uh, satellite imagery, for example, to count the number of roofs in certain areas to validate to what they are seeing from the census. So a similar process was done in Malawi and uh, with the objective of planning, this is a study done with the DL, Digital Impact Alliance and the Ministry of Health in Malawi, then to plan for uh, up to 2030 what should be the investment in terms of health, uh, health facilities based on the, where people uh, tend to aggregate in the country and with uh, these predictive models to understand basis of movements where people are going to, um, be, to be located in different years. And finally, this is an example of a different type of data that is the media source data with radio broadcasts. It's also, also, it's also um, done in Uganda and this is a project with Global Pulse. And uh, uh, the objective of this project was to understand um, if there were some environmental risks uh, at the time that uh, something will, would happen. For example, a flood would happen in a location. Uh, and this is more uh, fine-grained data that will be easily underreported in media or in terms of it doesn't get attention uh, of the government because it's, it's uh, limited to a particular area. So with, with the radio data, it's possible using uh, the speech-to-text models to detect words or expressions in several languages. And if you talk about Uganda, it's a country with, I think, more than 30 languages. So with multi-languages countries, to, to attack uh, in the audio segments words that are indications of any environmental problems, and then um, select that part of the audio and do the translation speak to, to text to understand what people were saying. It's also a system for monitoring environmental uh, risks and disasters. Uh, in, in relation to gender, um, Global Pulse is also in Uganda using the same technology, um, trying to, uh, to, to derive models to um, tag the, the audio data in terms of the gender, if it's a male or a female voice that will uh, uncover some insights in terms of participation of women in the in the public sphere in radio because interactive radio is very prevalent in uh, in African countries in particular in community radio stations. Okay, and finally, uh, because we were talking about call detail records yesterday, this is an example uh, of how in Uganda the mobile network operators they made the call detail records available that are the data that is coming from all the transactions that are made with mobile phones um, in terms of SMSs, calls received, calls made. And uh, I, I chose this example because it, um, uh, it includes, a, from a methodological point of view, an innovation that is how can we link big data with survey data. So this is the mobile networks operator data linked with demographic and health surveys in Rwanda. So the objective was to understand if only with the mobile net network operator's data, the CDRs, was possible to predict levels of poverty in, district, in different districts of Rwanda. 
So this is done using a methodology that is called Amplified Asking. There's a author called Salgani who published a book last year um, that presents different strategies to link big data with survey data that should be applied to social sciences. And this is one of the strategies that consists of um, obtaining the big data source and then for a random sample of big data source to link it with uh, the, they call it the design data that is data from surveys so people receive phone calls to ask them questions about the situation of their household whether they, people were employed what would be the valuable income uh, how they, did, did they use their money and so on to create an index of wealth for the household and if you have that for a random sample of big data, you can create an algorithm, or algorithmic model and then use machine learning to guess for those people you don't have the survey data, what, we, what the survey data will be based only on cold data records. And they went one step further. They link it to digital health surveys because from digital health surveys, they have, they have representative surveys in the country to know what are the different um, levels of health for different districts. So they validate the model with, with the data that is robust and is widely considered valid, that is the AHS. And um, yeah, and it was successful in a way that they present through different analytic techniques and in terms of maps and geographies that only using the model network operators is possible to predict the level of wealth. And we can think of health also because we have health in the demographic health service. So all the indicators of the demographic health service, they can be subject to this type of methodology to understand how big data can be related with. Sorry, so just clarification, did they also include um, the spending patterns on, on they include that in, because I'd imagine that's also quite predictive of one's yes. you know, social state, and not social state, socioeconomic status. Yes, exactly. That's the, the underlying theory. They include that as part of mobile net, network operators. So they just assume that people who will call more often, they were people that would be better off. Oh, I see. So, they, so it's, it's interesting to understand the boundaries of the data you can get from mm -hmm. MNOs. So yes. if you can get call data records, but they won't give you the spending information on the number. Yes. I don't know. The actual stuff. They don't give you information on the top up. It's only yeah, in terms yeah, of the, yeah. the flow <coughs> and the volume of the transactions. Right. That's but this, this is like, I think this is study done in 2015. So we can think that maybe four years later, maybe it doesn't apply because maybe there are packages for um, free calls and people maybe they use internet. Internet is more an indicator of the wealth of the wealth place of the family than call data records. And this is something important in big data. These models, they are valid in a specific location for a specific period. We cannot take this as a theory that we can apply um, without some understanding of the context of why this happens. So my, my next point is about this. So for these four different examples that I show you, we have theories underlying. We have, for example, the theory of social norms that we think that underlies the way that people talk in the social, with the, in the, in the, with the communities about violence, and this may be predictive of, or it will increase the risk of people engaging in violence. Or we can have models for the transmi trans transmission of diseases that are related with environment. Or we have models for spending patterns in, 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 in holes that are related with <coughs> So in some cases, it's more obvious than others how the big data relates with the indicators that you are trying to measure. And uh, for these examples that I show you, um, of course, that they are um, very, because they are produced within the UN, uh, they abide for these ethical and, and privacy issues. And there's a, a, a framework. So there are a framework that was developed by Global Pulse on how we can apply the privacy issues that usually were used in traditional studies to big data. There are new risks and new privacy concerns when you talk about big data compared to traditional data sources. And there's also a risk science and benefits assessment tool that was produced by UNDG. Okay, so what are the pros and the cons of big data? So big data has characteristics that make it um, uh, valuable if you want to monitor and if you want to measure. 
So for monitoring, the fact that it's real-time data, is always on, is non-reactive, is big, it, the fact that it's big that is not necessarily good, but in situations it's good. For example, if you want to understand rare effect, e events, for example, you want to understand the outbreak of a disease, but it's a disease that is, you know, for example, Zika outbreaks, uh, if you do uh, surveys, probably we, we don't reach people who are affected by the disease because of statistical reasons, because we use surveys, so it means that we have something, and, and minority groups, they may be overlooked due to the sampling strategies. Um, so with big data, we don't have that problem because we don't have samples, so we have all the data, even if you have one case in a population of a country with big data, as long as people are, have access to digital technologies and use them, you can identify them. Um, but there are problems with big data, and I think the resistance of people of thinking of big data and using big data for research and to, um, um, to monitor development goals has to do with the fact that it is incomplete. Incomplete means that you have missing data. There are many records that we have a blank cell. Uh, is inaccessible. So most of the data exists but in a private sector context, and we don't have access to them. There has been some initiatives in terms of um, making this data more accessible. For example, GovLab uh, in the US um, um, advanced this idea of the data collaboratives where private sector will make data available for social good. Um, there, but the data is also a problem that is non-representative. And I think representativeness is less re relevant when you talk about big data than when you talk, for example, about surveys, because we don't have samples. So the problem is, is here is non-coverage, is people who don't have access to these technologies or have access and don't use them. Um, and there's also the problem of the drifting. The platforms, for example, social media platforms change over time. So that is a big um, disadvantage when we want to understand um, longitudinal trends. And then it's also is dirty in a way that is messy, so we need to understand what is noise and what is signal, and this is not always easy, especially in data that is very spammy, and, and then is data that is sensitive um, in terms of privacy issues. So, uh, for example, in terms of GDPR regulations, we cannot collect uh, demographics and, and, and individual information for, the, for some data because it will make it more sensitive. But data is always sensitive because even if you don't know who are providing that data, if you don't have any demographic information, because we can have these different data linkages, it doesn't mean that you cannot link it with other data that will reveal that information. Or in the future, it's possible with a new technique or a method to get there. So we need to take big data as sensitive always. And uh, so now let me talk about what are the, how these uh, pros and cons of big data will reflect in terms of gender equality and health outcomes. And um, so in terms of gender equality, we know if, you, if you're thinking of um, big data that is human sourced, that is produced with internet and mobile phones, we know that the gender gap is something that we need to consider since the beginning. For example, in oh, I'm sorry. India is the country in the world with, um, with the gender gap in mobile phones is the highest. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, for example, 67% of men on mobile phones in India compared to 33% of women. And yesterday we saw like the examples for other South Asian countries, and we know that India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, they appear as outliers in terms of the gender gap. And um, uh, yesterday we had also a discussion about that, so I'm, I'm going to be brief here. But uh, why, how can we explain these gender gaps in mobile phone ownership? Uh, so this is based on data from the ITU, the International Tele Telecommunications Union, and in the y-axis we have the gender gap, and the x-axis we have economic barriers that are operationalized in terms of the cost of handsets and, uh, and the data in certain countries. So if you want to explain this gender gap in terms of economic barriers, the pattern is not that obvious we can see that the countries where the gender gap is higher are countries where the economic barriers are lower. But if you look at the gender inequality, you have the gender inequality index. Uh, we can see that the countries with the highest inequalities are countries with the highest gender gap. So that gives us our, already some answers that we suspect 
that the gender gaps in mobile phone ownership has to do with cultural and social barriers rather than purely economic barriers. And I would like just to show you a study that was done with Girl with Fact and Vogue Front Foundation last year. And uh, they call it, it's a, study, it's a qualitative study, they call it that was um, it's a, a global study of girls' access and usage of mobile phones to talk through 3,000 voices. So it's data, qualitative data collected in 25 countries that try to explain whether gender gaps exist in the younger population from 15 to 20 years old. And what was the explanation for the gender gaps? Asking people, why do you think you have a phone and your, your, your brother doesn't have a, a, a phone? A question that it has to go. But the study was done with boys and with girls. And we can see that there's a gender gap in terms of ownership of um, the basic phones and smartphones. Um, but what is more interesting here is the explanations where people think that, why, why girls and boys think that this gender gap exists. And we can see that it's related with social norms. So this, for example, in Bangladesh, people say that the girl who touches the phone is a bad girl. So this just puts this stigma on girls who own phones. There were girls saying that, people say that if I have a phone, I'm going to get pregnant because I'm going to get a boyfriend. Uh, so there are some girls that recognize the importance of having a phone because they, they make them, them feel secure, uh, they can call their relatives if they have any problem, but, but most of this data shows the stigma of girls around owning mobile phones at a younger age. And in a more quantitative way, uh, we can map the reasons for not owning a, a phone comparing girls and boys. And the, all the reasons where men uh, exceeds girls in terms of giving more, more men gave that reasons than, than women, uh, they are all economic. So unset costs is given more by male than by female, and uh, data costs. All the others that are related with parent safety concerns, fathers want to love, mothers want to love, family disapproval, own safety concerns, community disapproval, we have females, girls giving more these reasons than boys. So there are risks and challenges in terms of gender when we use this big data that is gendered in, in, in its essence because it's a reflection of the structural gender inequalities that exist in the world that you know, are cultural, social, and are reflected in access and how ownership and use. So when you think about social media, um, we can, yesterday we talked about um, there are not evidence about how gendered are the interactions in social media. We know that women are exposed to risks of harassment when they, they have their political opinions online. But there are not many research that analyze it systematically. One example is a study by Agnes International in 2017 that they, for a system of crowdsourcing where they ask people to donate their Twitter data to analyze it, they realize that this statistic take it with a pinch of salt because it's not representative. But they said that one in 10 black women that have any political um, uh, or any, um, it was any political affiliation, I think, one in 10 are subject of harassment on Twitter. So uh, they, they try to understand what will be the extent of harassment between men and women and where these harassment were coming from. And this, this report is, is amazing in terms of giving us qualitative evidence of the, these examples of harassment online, but it's, it's clear that harassment exists. And Twitter, based on this report, took some measures to prevent this harassment, for example, blocking certain users and identifying bots and so on. So one, one problem and one, one risk when we use big data is the elite capture. So we know that only a certain group of people are online. And these are not the people that you want to reach necessarily. And most of the cases is not. So we will have black holes in the data when we are trying to analyze, to derive insights from big data that is human sourcing. There is also restricted use. So even if people, if women have access to mobile phones, internet, they use it, uh, they use it in a different way that men will use. Uh, because of um, this the ambient sexism and restricted use, and I'm going to, to tell you what the difference is. So restricted use has to do with other factors 
that are not related to ownership and access. For example, in cases of violence against women, women can be restricted of using their mobile phones or using only at the certain times of the day or their mobile phones being monitored. So that will pose restrictions if our women use mobile phones. We saw that in the girl effect in front of Vodafone Foundation study with girls. Even girls who have access to mobile phones, they can only use the mobile phones at a certain times of the day, whether men they have access to, to, to mobile phones um, more um, widely. And ambient sexism has to do with this understanding of this harassment that exists in social media. And even if the, the people, the users, are not the direct targets of this harassment, just seeing that this harassment exists will constrain them in terms of what kind of information they are going to uh, make public online. So this affects women more than men. And, uh, and there's a question to whether the platform drifts, that it's not necessarily gender, but we can think that it may be possible. So if you think that there are differences in populations over time, online communities that use certain social media platforms, for example, maybe there, there are times where women use more the platform other times than men use more the platform. I don't have the statistics, but I imagine that, that probably the participation of women is increasing over time or maybe not. So it's something to think about of gender dimension of platform drifts and then ethical and privacy concerns that apply to both. So another risk in terms of big data has to do with the, the gender nature of the data itself. So if you have data that is biased in terms of men and women, and if you are deriving insights and creating algorithms based on this data, these algorithms will perpetuate these existing uh, differences. So for example, in terms of the, uh, the Google speech uh, software, um, I think one statistic that I saw is that it's 70% less likely to identify uh, less accurate uh, for women than for men. So it means that when you use this software, to, uh, uh, to derive insights from big data, the insights for men are more accurate than insights for women. And uh, you can think of gender, but you can think of other groups. You can think of languages that are not as used. You know, we know that majority languages, this is obvious for people who do analysis on big data, that uh, all these NL, uh, um, NLP uh, um, tools that are more accurate if you have English or Spanish or French than if you use any of the African languages. So we can also think in terms of health. Uh, if you think of data that is cre that created, generated organically by digital health technologies, uh, if you don't know if these technologies are um, equity, uh, gender equitable, if they are used by men and women in the same way, um, the data that is created, it can be sexist data. And if you're trying to make decisions related to, for example, health outcomes, it means that we can do more harm than good for women because the data that refers to women, the quality is not as good. And it can be wrong data, it can be sexist data. We can apply conclusions that, can be, uh, th that are derived from data majority for men to women when they don't apply for women. So it's, I think, another aspect of applying big data for health. And finally, uh, if you think about data privacy and protection frameworks, we know that in Europe we have the GDPR, we don't have the GDPR in Africa. So it, it depends, there's I think some guidelines by the African Union in terms of data protection and, and risks, uh, but not all the countries have implemented data protection guidelines. So it means that if you work in certain countries, uh, it's not that you can do whatever you want, of course, but you're not constrained by regular, regulatory frameworks in, the, in terms of data privacy. Um, and that poses people at risk. So it means those who are worse off, that are those who live in these countries, they will be more exposed of risks related to data breaches and identifying people that are, it's not necessarily something good. We can, know how we can use this data for, for the for negative consequences in terms of, for example, targeting people for political reasons or others. Okay, so finally as a conclusion, so we understand these risks of big data. There's not enough evidence to, um, I think, 
to reflect on them. We know when we think about risks, it's just from a logical perspective thinking what will be the implications. For example, we don't have data on sexist data for health and how this is going to affect men and women in a different way. But we, since the beginning, we can start thinking of how can we design technologies that are gender equitable and we and try to understand the risks when you create data flows so and methodologies that will give us insights that will apply equally for men and women or to understand how these technologies will help us to reduce gaps that exist already between men and women. So based on the discussion yesterday with might, I think the way of expanding the room is bringing more voices. So we know there are people whose lives and voices are not reflected in big data, but these people have access to technology, or even if they don't have access to technology, they have a voice, so they can produce data. So data doesn't need to be passively produced. We can be active producers of data if you understand that data is going to be used to improve our lives. So that's what citizen-generated projects uh, have been doing. There are not many examples of citizen-generated data related to um, gender equality. Um, there are, for example, we have the Women Connect, that is part of Humanitarian Open uh, Street Map uh, team, and uh, they have several projects uh, in Africa and Latin America where women collect their own data uh, related to uh, inequalities, for example, in terms of pay or in terms of uh, situations of harassment or any other gender inequalities that they experience uh, in, the, in the course of their lives and they report this data and this data is aggregated and, and analyzed in a way that it will be presented at the community level. What are the main issues with gender in these different communities? Or we have for example Haras Map that is a project that exists in Egypt and in India where women uh, also using a app they can tag what are specific incidents in related to harassment that exist, and this is a crowdsourcing project, so it gives information to other women what are the parts of the cities, for example, to avoid. And um, yes, yeah, so the value of the citizen generated data when complemented with big data, it would be, it, you know, we know that is also data that is not representative, but is data that gives us a different dimension that is not present when you look at uh, official statistics, mainly because official statistics, they relate to a country, whether with citizen-generated data, they relate to small communities that are likely to be excluded because their voices are not going to be considered in these national statistical exercises. So in a way to, I think, to derive the value from big data will be to complement it in citizen-generated data, particularly for hard-to-reach populations or to validate trends and insights generated by big data and involving citizens in the production interpretation of use of data because the generation the, the generation of data can be done by a participatory process but the interpretation of data can also be by citizens they will be best placed to interpret the data that they are home producing uh, so there are some questions and some maybe ways forward in terms of uh, how we can leverage big data for development in a way that it doesn't exacerbate some um, gender inequalities that already exist. Thank you. Any questions? We can continue yeah. to the next presentation and have an overall discussion at hand.